uh, let's go back to our story, where our computer is just in the process of turning on still. So we've tested our video card. It's good to go. We've tested our memory. It's good to go. We've looked at all of our peripherals. We know the flash drives that are plugged in, if we're connected to any printers or anything like that. So now, finally, we're, we're done. We're testing all of our hardware. We're good to go. We're going to start moving forward with actually turning the computer on into something that you can use. So the first thing that BIOS needs to do is it needs to load your operating system off of the hard drive. So if before we looked at RAM and memory, and we called that your computer's short-term memory, the hard drive is more of its long-term storage. So where RAM has something like between 2 and 4 gigabytes, your hard drive typically has hundreds of gigabytes of space. So this is where all of your movies and your music collection will actually be stored. So your hard drive nowadays might take several forms. So here, this motherboard, it actually supports connections to two different types of hard drives. So on the top right, we see these things called SATA connectors. And there are four little ports. And this is what one of your, a newer hard drive is going to plug into. So to the left of this, we have these other ports called the IDE, or it might also call them PETA or ATA. And these are the little 18-inch ribbon cables uh, that you may have seen. And these are what are going to connect kind of older hard drives uh, into your computer. So you notice here that your motherboard has slots for hypothetically six hard drives. So what are some reasons you might want that? Yeah, so you might just want to have more storage, right? You have, might have a huge movie collection, or you're digitizing you know, all of your family photos. You might just need more space than your computer came with. What are some other reasons we might want more hard drives? Yeah, so that's great. So as a backup, so let's say that I'm using my computer, and all of a sudden, I get a hard drive failure. And even though that's devastating, it's not all too uncommon, um, since the hard drive has, uh, one of the older hard drives has a ton of moving parts. So the possibility for mechanical failure is actually pretty high. So if one of those hard drives fails, we could want to have some backup drive. So using a technology you may have heard of called RAID, what I can do is I can actually set up my computer to say, I want this second hard drive plugged into my motherboard to be an exact replica of this other hard drive. So that way, when one fails, I still have this totally redundant copy, and I didn't have to worry about anything like dropping my desktop. So a third reason might be performance. There are other ways you can configure your computer to say, I want to write half of this file to this drive and the other half of this data to this other drive. So then when I go to read that data, because I'm reading from half the data from two different sources, I can actually end up speeding up my read. So this is what the inside of a traditional HDD, or hard disk drive, looks like. So look at this in much more detail uh, next week. But up here, you see we have these three silver platters. And these platters are basically coated in this magnetic film. And this is where your data is actually stored, on these little disks. Over to the left, uh, you have this little actuator arm. And this is going to move uh, back and forth really, really quickly in order to determine where the, uh, read the data that's actually stored on those disks. So your computer also may have something called an SSD, or a solid state drive. If you have a MacBook Air, for example, the hard drive inside of that doesn't look anything like this. It's actually pretty boring, just kind of a silver little box that has flash memory, which is much like the same type of memory that's in the thumb drives that we can plug into our USB. And it's just going to end up being much faster um, than this traditional hard disk drive. But we'll see that in much more detail uh, next week. OK, so we're going to our hard drive. And now the BIOS knows exactly what it's looking for. It's looking for something, this piece of software, some code that someone wrote. It's looking for something called the kernel. And the kernel is basically one of the lowest level, one of the, uh, the closest to the hardware pieces of software on your PC. The job of the kernel, really, is to interface between some code that someone wrote and the actual hardware. Right? So when you hit Control p or Command-P in Microsoft Word, and you need to start printing something. There's some piece of software that needs to actually say, OK, I'm working from my code. I need to send some data through that cable into the printer and have it print. Or if I'm in Microsoft Word again and I open a file, something needs to tell me how to get that file off of the physical hard drive that's stored on my computer and start working with it inside of a program I'm running. So that's something that's handled by the kernel. And this is a really super complicated piece of software. So we don't need to go into any more detail than this is kind of what interfaces between the, some higher level software, like a program, and the actual hardware that's powering your computer. So the execution of all of this code is going to be powered by something called a CPU. So the CPU, or processor, as you might hear, shorter, is really the brains of your computer. Right? This is really what puts the compute in computer. The processor is what's going to handle all of the operations, like the additions or accessing memory, that your computer might do. So this processor is actually operating at thousands of calculations per second, which is pretty amazing. 
And so you might have seen when you're purchasing a new computer a processor that has 2.4 gigahertz or 2.6 gigahertz. So that number is actually referring to how many calculations per second that your processor is constantly doing. So that's pretty crazy fast. So even though the CPU is actually one of the most important parts of your computer, it's also one of the smallest. So a CPU, uh, if you look over on the left-hand side, that big empty space, this is probably where your CPU is going to plug in. So you see that there are tons of small little holes, almost 1,000. These are little pins that are connected to the bottom of your CPU, and they're just going to slide right into those holes. So your CPU uh, could look something like this, really, really small, even though it's capable of doing this incredible processing power. But really, uh, when you plug it into your motherboard, it's going to look something like this. I also have one here. So this is basically the mounting component for your CPU. It's called a heat sink. So the heat sink's job is to make sure that the CPU stays cool. So down at the bottom here, this tiny little chip, this is actually the CPU. You can see there's little tiny pins that are actually going to plug into the motherboard. So as the CPU is operating, it actually has a tendency to get really, really hot. And if that happens, then your bad things could happen. Your computer could start to overheat, uh, and things aren't going to end so well if you have a laptop on your lap. So it's really important that somehow this CPU stays cool. And so we have two ways of doing that. One, we actually have some adhesive down at the top of the CPU that keeps everything cool by dissipating the heat. We also have the more primitive fan on the top of it. And so the idea of the fan is we need to make sure that the CPU in particular and the rest of the computer stays cool at all times so you don't burn your legs. So now we mentioned that we're going to load the operating system off of the hard drive. So the operating system is basically the piece of software that as inter inter soon as you turn on your computer, you start interacting with. So the job of the operating system is to allow you to run other software. So essentially, this is a computer program whose job is to run other computer programs, which is pretty meta. So some of the popular operating systems today that you might have heard of could be Apple's uh, OS X or OS X or Windows 8. And so even though these are two completely separate brands, question? Yeah, so the question is, is the kernel part of the operating system? And it is. The kernel that runs Windows is probably very different than the kernel that runs Linux or uh, OS X. It just so happens that this is the first piece of the operating system to be loaded. But you're totally right in that that software, the same people who wrote Windows 8 also wrote the Windows kernel. So they're integrated in that sense. So even though these are two different brands of operating system, and when you turn on an Apple, PC, an Apple uh, computer, it's very different than turning on a Windows PC, right? Windows happens to like their square little tiley things now, and Apple tends to like their dock at the bottom. And so really, these are just two different approaches uh, to interacting with your computer. There's nothing fundamentally different about what the Apple operating system does and what the Windows operating system does. Both just allow you to interact with new programs. But because we have these two different companies and these two different competing perspectives on how it's best to interact with your computer, we end up with these different brands. So both of these really accomplish the same goal of allowing you to run additional programs and interact with your computer. OK, so at this point, we've loaded up the operating system, and now we're good to go. Right? We have our nice icons on the desktop. We have our picture of our friend as a wallpaper. And we can start using our computer. So let's now take a step back and just kind of look at all the different components that we saw interact with each other during the startup process. So we can kind of split the motherboard uh, in half. So not literally. That would be an expensive mistake. Um, but conceptually, we have two different parts of the motherboard. At the top here, we have this thing called the North Bridge. And the North Bridge is designed to connect all of the components that interact really frequently with the processor. So as your computer is running, it's really commonly going to need to do things like display pixels, and read data from its short-term memory. So we have this dedicated controller called the North Bridge. And the job of this is to coordinate the communication between the processor, who says, I need to add two numbers, and memory, who says, here are the two numbers that you need to add. So actually, on modern CPUs, this actually isn't a separate chip on the motherboard. This is just all one uh, component. So then down here at the bottom, we have the self bridge. And the job of the self bridge is to coordinate the communication between devices that may not be accessed as frequently. Right? The, the amount of time you need to display something on your screen and the number of times that you need to read data from a flash drive are probably really different. And so by splitting it up like this, this is just kind of more nicely organizes our motherboard and we can have better communication. So the job of the South Bridge then is to coordinate the communication between anything in the North Bridge, whether it be your CPU trying to read something from your hard drive, and then the South Bridge, so everything else that's connected. So this is kind of a, a high level view of what the motherboard looks like. So now, 
uh, let's take a look at two components in particular uh, that are probably really essential to you using your computer every day. So the first is the keyboard. So how does the keyboard work? So your keyboard actually inside probably looks something like this. So at first, I thought this was just a map of the green line, given how disorganized it is. But this is actually the inside of your keyboard. And this thing is called a key matrix. So each of these uh, little black dots, it looks kind of like a, a sun. Each of these is located underneath a key. And these green lines here are creating a circuit inside of your keyboard. So now whenever I press down a key, what that's going to do is it's going to complete some circuit, which basically sends some current to my keyboard's little processor. So you can actually consider the keyboard to be a little computer in and of itself. It has its own processor. It also has a little bit of memory. Somehow the, computer need, the keyboard needs to actually understand, OK, if I just pressed the space bar and suddenly that, that circuit got completed, what key was just pressed? So this is stored in a component called the keyboard ROM, or read-only memory, where basically the keyboard remembers where the space bar is or where the shift key is, so that when you press it, the keyboard knows exactly what key was pressed. So then we're going to forward this along to my motherboard. To do so, I can use either a USB cable, which probably connected to, or some older keyboards might also be uh, connected using this thing called PS2, uh, which isn't in, really in use anymore, because USB is much better. So that's the keyboard. So how about the mouse? So the older uh, ball mice uh, work a little bit differently. They're much more mechanical. So this is kind of what the inside of a ball mouse would look like. So here we have that giant ball that if you were kind of a meddling kid, uh, in school, you may have taken out of your computer lab's computers and then kept so no one could use the mouse. Uh, but the way this works is that we have these two rods connected to the ball. Whenever I move the ball, these rods are going to turn. And attached to the end of these rods are these big disks, and they have small little slits inside of them. So that means whenever I move the ball, these two rods are going to rotate, and either representing either an x direction or a y direction, because as you can see, the rods are kind of perpendicular to each other. So connected to these disks here are two tiny infrared sensors that basically send a beam of light right through that black disk. So because that disk has little slits in it, that means as the disk spins, we're going to either block that light or let that light through. So that means the faster that I'm moving the mouse, that means the faster that rod is turning and the faster the disk is moving, and the faster I'm either allowing or blocking light. And so that is how we're going to start tracking not only the direction of movement, but also the speed. So a quick video uh, makes this a little more concrete. So you can see here just a, a 3D rendering of the inside of a mouse. What? Oh. Let's try that again. So here we have a 3D rendering of the inside of a mouse. So just that makes it a little bit more concrete. You can see here that there are beams of light and they're shining through that black disk. And as it spins, either the light is blocked or it's let through. And that's how we can know how fast we're actually moving. So let's jump back. So those mice aren't really too common anymore. They're kind of uh, easy to break and annoying to use because you can need like a special mouse pad. You can't use them anywhere. And so now we've started moving to optical mice. So Apple's magic mouse, as you might have seen, or really any mouse that you might buy now, is optical. So the difference here is that there are no more moving components. Instead, what we have is a small laser. If you ever picked it up, and hopefully not shown it in your face, you see that a red light came out of it. And that red light, when you put it on a surface, is going to reflect back into the mouse. So what the mouse is going to do is it's going to remember the pattern that was reflected back. So if the mouse isn't moving, then we're constantly reflecting the same pattern right back into the mouse. But as soon as we start to move, that pattern's going to change. Right? We suddenly, things that were at the top are going to be at the bottom of our picture if we move the mouse up. So based on the rate at which these patterns are changing, suddenly now the mouse can figure out, am I moving left, am I moving right, or down? And how fast am I going, based on the rate of how fast these things are changing? So suddenly we don't need any more of these mechanical components. And it turns out this is actually much more accurate. Right? When you're, if you have ever seen a, like a high-performance gaming mouse, or if you're into really um, intense gaming, it's really important that the mouse is super accurate. 
And we can achieve this accuracy not with a little ball in these circular slits, but with lasers, which is awesome.